Hey guys, Toby Mathis here, and today we're going to go into the difference between an S corporation and an LLC. I seem to get that question all the time, so we're going to dive straight on in. First off, we're going to have to make sure that we understand and we're using the same language. So I'm going to share a screen out. So I'm going to make three columns one, two, three. And those columns, I'm going to label the state, the IRS, and third parties. Oof, I butchered that one. Parties. All right. Why are we breaking this into three categories? Because you got to understand that when we say LLC versus S Corp, it's actually kind of a false dichotomy because an LLC can be an S corp. And I'll make that make sense here in a second. First off, the state, you are paying it money for protections. And those protections take the form of entities. So for example, you could have a limited partnership You could have a corporation. Pen like giving me a little trouble here. You could have a corporation. You could have a LLC, which is equal to limited liability company. And what the state is doing is giving you certain protections. You'll notice I didn't say S Corp or C Corp or nonprofit or, if, you know, we start getting into, into the weeds here. The state has very broad categories. And what they're doing is you are paying them money and they are giving you protection. And this is how it works. Let's say that you set up an entity. Let's say this is an LLC and it is doing a business and there's a liability in that business and they try to come out here and get to you, it's gonna ricochet right back in. It's gonna stay within the walls of that company. It's gonna bounce around there, the liability. So let's say that you're a plumber and you flood somebody's house, you do something wrong on a job or something, you forget one of your, one of your workers forgets to attach a pipe actually had this happen to one in my houses, so I can actually say, and it floods. Okay, your liability, when if, if, if you get sued, is limited to your business. They're not gonna come take all your personal assets if you have the protection of an entity. That's why people set up these little LLCs all the time, because they provide a ton of protection. This has nothing to do from with taxes. An LLC, could be whatever it wants to be as far as the IRS concerned. In fact, there is no tax form for an LLC. You have to tell the IRS how you want it to be uh, taxed. Okay, when the pen doesn't get me. All right, so from a IRS standpoint, let me just go through what our options are because we have individuals where you're filing a 1040 you have partnerships where you're filing a 1065. You have C corporations. This is what all corporations start off as. And they start off as what's called an 1120. Then you have S corporation, which is when you file a special request to treat it under a different chapter of the Internal Revenue Service, a subchapter, and that's why they call them S, they're subchapter S. So people will generally call a plain vanilla corporation, a C Corp, and an S Corp, they'll call it an S Corp. Uh, corporations, just so you know, they're taxed at 21% on their net income, on their profit. S corporations, it flows down to the shareholders. Everything else here flows down to the shareholders. Now, there are exempt organizations that we're all familiar with, IRAs, 401k, 457s, um, 
even 501s. You guys are probably familiar with 501c3s, but 501s are exempt. And then you have trusts. Which file this 1041? Why is this relevant to this? the whole comment between a LLC versus an S-Corp? Because the LLC can be an S-Corp. It could be a C-Corp. It could be a partnership. It could be you. In fact, 99% of the time when I see folks that are comparing an LLC versus an S-Corp, what they're really comparing is themselves as a business versus their LLC taxed as a corporation, generally an S-Corp. So I'll go over that here in a second. They could be exempt. They could be an LLC that is taxed as a trust. Um, yes, some of you guys just said, oh no, corporations are the only type. You could technically, you could set up an LLC and get it uh, exempt uh, under 501c3. You could also have an LLC that is, uh, the, the member is an IRA or the member is a 401k. So it's taxed on those tax forms. IRA, uh, 401ks, you're talking about 5,500s, uh, 501c3s, uh, 501s, private foundations, all these things are on a 990. So there's different types of tax forms for everything, but the IRS doesn't really care what you did with the state. They just say, how do you want to tax it? How do you want us to look at it? What tax form is it going to go on to? So if you make $100,000, we know where it's going to land so we can track it. That's all they care about. They wanna get paid. Third parties. Now, who are we talking about when we're talking about third parties? We are talking about, quite often, we're talking about banks, lenders, investors, municipalities, you know, for business licensing and things like that. What they're going to want to see is your agreement, your body. And your body, if it's an LLC, is called an operating agreement. You never want to leave these things to chance. You got to document. This is the rights of the, in an LLC, the owners are called members. The managers are called managers, believe it or not. So you have to choose whether you're going to be managed by your members or your managers. Uh, we're almost always using uh, managers, but it's going to say who has the right to manage the company. What are the rules that they're operating under? You understand now why a bank might want to know that because, hey, I'm setting up a bank account. Who can access it? Who? How, how much? Um, can they just drain the account? Uh, can they buy whatever they want? They want to see that operating agreement so they know kind of the parameters that they have around the folks that they're engaging with, that they have authority to bind that LLC. Because remember, we have asset protection. This whole thing right here, the banks and lenders and everybody else, even other businesses, they want to know, like we could put that up there, other businesses, they want to know you have the right to engage in this transaction because if they sue the business, they know that they're going to be limited in what they can get back. So they're going to be limited to what's inside that business. If they're not comfortable with that business, what they might do is they might come to you and say, hey, I understand that you want this loan or you're going to do this transaction, but I want a guarantee. And I want one of the members to guarantee, be a personal guarantor. And I'm certain that a lot of you guys in real estate have had to deal with that uh, because they don't want to be stuck inside the box. They want to know that, if, hey, if I end up looking at loss, like I don't know what you're going to do with the property if I loan on it. If you destroy the property, I still want to be able to look at somebody else. So that's always a negotiating point. When you are a corporation, they use something called bylaws. That's the same thing. We created a body. So now we know what the rules are that cover that. Now, people always say, like, what's the difference between an LLC and an S-Corp? Well, nomenclature, right? They call uh, an LLC will call its people members. A corporation, a plain vanilla corporation, like you set it up under the state, has shareholders. But guess what? I could be an LLC. I could be this taxed as an S-Corp 
and I still have members, even though they're shareholders, right? They're going to, IRS is considering them shareholders, but from a state standpoint, I'm calling them members. They're basically synonymous. There's one case when you're dealing with stock loss on a privately held company where it makes a difference between being an, a, an LLC proper versus an S or a corporation proper versus an LLC. Other than that, they're almost identical. And so that gets us out of when we're dealing with, uh, with third parties, but that's not the calling of this, right? When I, when, when I hear people say, what's the difference between an LLC and an S corporation, what they're really doing is they're getting over here into the tax world. And they're saying, what's the difference between these things from a tax perspective? And I'm just going to do it like this. I'm going to say, remember, we started with the state. Let's just do a state level. And we're going to do a comparison. I am an LLC versus an S Corp. But we now know that an LLC can be taxed as an S Corp. So I'm going to say LLC taxed as S Corp. So we're literally changing our story from an LLC versus an S Corp to an LLC versus anything taxed as an S Corp. So it could be an S Corp or an LLC taxed as an S Corp. And from the state standpoint, it's either an LLC or it's an S Corp or LLC. We're just taxing that LLC as an S Corp. From the IRS standpoint, we're doing a comparison this LLC is going to flow on to your, it's called a sole proprietor. And it's going to go on to your 1040. Um, if you are have an LLC tax as an S Corp or an S Corp proper, it's going to go on to an 1120S. So you're, boom, they're both going on to separate tax returns. This is going on a Schedule C. But here's where it gets really interesting. S corporations, their net income and their losses flow on to the owners or the shareholders tax return. They flow down to those owners. So if this is you, it's literally going to end up on your 1040. Because it's this is going to create what's called a K1, which is a, it's going to file its tax return and say, here's the owner who this is their portion of the income. If it's just you, it's going to be a hundred percent and it's going to end up being on your schedule E. That's the difference from a tax form standpoint. They both end up on your 1040. And that's really important to, to understand. Again, people seem to think that these S corporations are some sort of mystical beast and that somehow it's not affecting their personal tax. No, it does, but I'll show you what it, you know, how it benefits you. Uh, in both cases, the net income loss ends up on the return. In both cases, the net income or loss ends up on your 1040. They're very similar in that manner. That's why there's, there's, there's such a misunderstanding because they're very, very close. But the treatment of that income is very different. And the reason being is because 100% of net income is subject to ordinary tax and social security when you are a sole proprietor. Ordinary tax is your normal tax return. You have state taxes too, but from a federal standpoint, we're just comparing this. Social security is 15.3%. So it's old age, disability and survivors and Medicare. There's a phase out at when you get above 160,000. There's a phase back in when you get back up over 240. So like there's, it varies, but I'm just gonna say for our purposes, let's just say regular, regular business, you're probably talking about uh, 100, 150,000. It's just, this is, these are the numbers. Uh, when you are a S Corp, only 
wages are subject to Social Security. And that is because you are not an employee of your sole proprietor, but you are an employee of an escort. You cannot be an employee of your own sole proprietorship. And that means there's some tax differences. The biggest one is in this particular case, 100% of your net is going to be subject to social security tax. Whereas realistically, only about 70% of net is going to flow down as profit. And it does not get hit with social security. Put another way, on average, only about 30% of income, which will be made into wages, is equal to social security. Let me just spell that out for you. You make $100,000 as a sole proprietor. You are going to pay roughly that 15.3%. There's a slight deduction for a portion of it. So it ends up being 14.1% when you do the math. So you're going to pay $14,100 in employment taxes. You're going to pay tax, your, your federal income tax on the, the remainder of the money that flows down as well. So like, like you're going to have $100,000 of taxable income that hits you. And I'm just using this as an example. People that have S-Corps know that there's more deductions that you get as an S-Corp. Uh, I'm going to go over that in just a second, but I'm just, I just want to illustrate this point. So if we take a wage, let's say that we paid $30,000 in wages. Let me just do the math on that real quick. So if we have $30,000 that we take as a wage, we're going to pay $4,230 in employment taxes versus $14,000. So the net difference is a positive $9,870 per year by doing that escort. And again, S Corp or LLC taxes and S Corp. You could literally take this that you are doing now as a sole proprietor and we could make a late, we can make an S election. You can make a late S election actually. You could do it at the end of the year if you, if you really wanted to. Um, you could even do it when you do the tax return. There's ways to, to, to fix it. But at the end of the day, you're looking at this going, shoot, there's a big difference from a tax standpoint, but it gets better. Because employees get something called an accountable plan, which equals 100% of things like cell phones, uh, computers. Uh, you could do something called 280A and, uh, and write off your, uh, your, your house as a meeting room up to 14 times a year. You could do an administrative office in your home, uh, which means uh, a much larger deduction than like the home office. And uh, I'm just gonna explain it like this. If I am a sole proprietor, I only get a percentage of the free stuff. And when I say st free stuff, I just mean tax deductible. So if I have a cell phone here, and I am a sole proprietor, I have to track what portion of my time that I'm using as business versus personal. And I can write off the business. When I do an accountable plan and I'm an employee and my employer says, I want you to have a cell phone, you need to have a cell phone. It's 100% that they're writing off. So there's a huge difference. So there's a, there's a myriad of tax benefits, which means that on a on a typical year it's over ten thousand dollars difference 
on a hundred thousand dollars and an extra 10 percent of profit which some of you guys that's doubling your profit maybe tripling it maybe all your profit just because we're changing the way that it's designated and you know changing its treatment now there's a lot of other tricks that you can use and, and lots of other benefits that come along with knowing how to run your business, right? And running it from a tax perspective, running it correctly. Uh, I'm not going to get into all those today. I'm just going to say that from a 10,000 foot view, you have a pretty good idea of the difference now between that LLC and that S Corp. And you can see why there's a lot of confusion when people are asking it because t guys like me are looking at it going an LLC versus an S Corp. Well, an LLC could be an S Corp. So really what we should be asking is a sole proprietor versus an S Corp. And when we break that down, it's it's not even close. And by the way, S corporations get audited a fraction of the time that the sole proprietorships get audited. It's about 800% more often that they get audited as a sole proprietor. And then according to the last data book, I saw 17B, I think it was 20 of 2000, and they discontinued it. They used to track the audit rate and the success of those audit rates for sole proprietors. And it was about a 94 to 95% of the time the sole proprietorships lost their audits for the reasons that I just laid out because they're supposed to be tracking all their personal use of all of their assets and nobody does. Let's just be real. Most people do not track that. It's hard enough to get people to track their miles and their mileage and there's apps that'll do it for you, right? And we still have a lot of folks that just won't track their miles. They try to write off their automobiles and do all these, these things. And all you got to do is you know, is, is think realistically. And you're like, okay, I don't want to make my clients jump through those hoops. I want to make it as simple as possible for them and make sure they're getting the biggest benefit. And 99% of the time you're going to fall on the same way that I do, which is, it's going to be something other than a sole proprietorship. Uh, S corporation is the usual suspect as far as the, for most practitioners, most accountants, good accountants, they're almost always going straight to that S corp, especially if you're living out of the entity, because you want to have access to those, those dollars. They're just a lot easier to use. There's a lot more benefit. And the only complexity that you're going to have to deal with is having to go through payroll, uh, in taking a wage out. You could do that once a year, by the way, you could do it quarterly. You could do it monthly if you want, but, uh, it, you're taking out some sort of payroll, usually about a third of uh, the net income is about what the courts have always decided, but it's technically, it's a reasonable amount. So you, you're in charge of that. What I've seen, it's usually about a third, usually about 30%. So we just use that as a, as a, as a starting point. Uh, but at the end of the day, you want to be talking to your practitioner on that one. So hopefully you learned something today. If you know anybody that could benefit from this, by all means, please share it. Please like, and subscribe. It helps us out uh, immensely when you do that. Plus you'll get notified when new videos come out. If you want to talk to somebody about whether or not it makes sense for you to be an S Corp versus just being a sole proprietor. So you can make your LLC into an S Corp, or if you're just operating as a sole proprietor and you want to get started, type in the word strategy down in the comments, just write in strategy and uh, somebody will send you a link so you can get a free consultation to see whether it makes sense.